So, welcome to our second module of the day, Fleet Smarts. Uh, this is really where we want to talk about and learn uh, how to pick your hardware, what's out there, uh, why you should be choosing certain modalities or certain form factors within your modality, how it can fit for your operating model, and kind of expanding to go multimodal eventually. So, today's uh, vehicles are not really just designed for uh, the sharing economy, uh, or sorry, not just for the sharing economy, but by the sharing economy. A lot of manufacturers today were once operators. They started out by working for Lime, or Bird, or Voy, and they've decided to branch out on their own. They learned what worked from a certain vehicle model type. It might be bigger wheels, or swappable batteries, or range, or this, that, whatever, and they've decided to make their own new purpose-built form factor. We started to get into new types of sharing models as it relates to not just people sharing, but also goods and parcels delivery. Food delivery, you see Gitir and Gorillas all over the place. They're not using just a scooter to stand up. They're not using a pedal bike. They have uh, mopeds and e-bikes and purpose-built uh, cargo e-bikes. So we're going to get into a little bit of that. Uh, really, what, what you're going to see on the market today is robust units that uh, are built to last the long haul. They're not meant to break every 28 days, which was the case with Segways and Geomies back in 2018. Those manufacturers have come a long way in designing more commercially ready vehicles because, again, it comes down to unit economics. And if you're really trying to spread out the cost of your very expensive units, uh, you want them to last three plus years so that your daily or per ride costs really is driven down and not trying to pay back your entire unit in one month before it breaks. Some of the, be, the big uh, innovations we've seen is, is uh, larger and, and more durable tires and wheels. Uh, solid state tires are still there, but we also see pneumatic tires starting to make their way into the marketplace, going from seven and a half inch plastic wheels all the way up to 12 and a half and, and larger uh, tires, stuff that can go over the bricks and cobblestones that you see on the roads today without rattling your arms uh, to death. Uh, you're starting to see more powerful motors. I know there are regulations, and depending on your geography, but we didn't even have three 150 watt motors a few years ago. It used to just be uh, 100 to 200. And so we're seeing uh uh, different vehicles that can actually get up hills with someone like me that weighs 112 kilos can actually get up a hill without slowing down and having to use what I call the turbo boost, your leg getting up a motor or a hill. Uh, you're starting to see mechanical brakes. I don't know anyone who rode a scooter in 2017 with electric brakes. Uh, if you were going down a hill, you were not stopping. You were going into oncoming traffic or bailing. Uh, now we have <laughs> mechanical brakes that are more like your, your bikes where you can actually guarantee that you're going to come to a stop safely. Uh, and we're starting to see swappable batteries. I actually have the unique distinction of uh, launching the very first swappable battery market in the world back in 2019. It was a game changer. We saw operations where our costs dropped 50% overnight because we got to keep our vehicles out in the the marketplace 24-7. Uh, before that, as many of you know, uh, scooters and e-bikes had to be brought back literally by the fleet size in large trucks that spit out a bunch of petrol fumes, which is antithetical to the entire mission of this industry, just to go to large warehouses where you're taking up a ton of space, just like you were trying to get rid of cars and garages, you're doing the same thing with your fleets. Now, keep these vehicles out in the road, swapping batteries, keeping them going 24-7, making more money, keeping your consumers happy. Now, we're going to kick off the rest of this, this section with a, a nice little mini hardware panel. So I'm going to uh, introduce, uh, again, my colleague, Marcus Daman, who's going to be kind of leading this panel, and our four distinguished guests. Uh, Marcus, why don't you come on up and, and, and bring everyone on board? <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you all. So let me introduce to you here, this is Tom Melby from Bullride, but he's also like working for an operator, and Marc Antoine from Acton. David from Element, who is uh, both our uh, hardware manufacturers, and Sina from Swabby, who they produce battery swapping stations. I'm Marcos, vehicle partner manager, and used to work also in the OEM sector before. Today, I would like to start with Tom. Uh, as an operator, I was curious to know from you, like, how do you select hardware? Like, what is your main criteria, and then how do you benchmark the hardware and decide for the best? Yeah, uh, obviously uh, we need the durability of the scooter, um, and uh, if there are parts on the scooter that can might break easily, um, we also we all had problems with spare parts, right? And um, sometimes you need to look at uh, the parts if it's possible to make yourself or make your own solution for it, and. Um, 
obviously uh, is changing now. Uh, the tires are getting bigger. Uh, we also look at the, the weight and the measurements of the scooters because we know that to make a good revenue, you need to move the scooters around in the city as well uh, so they can fit easily into an event. So um, all those kind of questions to look at. So when you go and you see, for example, an e-bike or a kick scooter, there's those factors that are visible, okay, you can touch it. But actually, to every OEM, there's those invisible factors, stuff like connectivity, maybe customer support. Uh, you said it already, uh, the spare parts. So how do you evaluate that? You mean the IOTs or...? Yeah, for example, like stuff that... Uh, Okay, you can decide for a certain OEM, but then later you will have to return to that OEM for getting spare parts or uh, uh, customer support for when the IoT doesn't work. And that's not something that you can find out at that moment. So how do you? No, you check have out to that? contact the, the manufacturer and contact uh, if it's Segway or Okai or Fenchin, different. Well, yeah, Acton. Also, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, ask them about uh, how they produce uh, the lead times of different spare parts and all that stuff. Okay, good. Let me switch over to Sina. So, Swabi promises that you basically improve and also reduce the operational costs of. Um, Operators, you've got an operator sitting here. So can you explain to him right now, how do you do that? Because when you look at the station, it looks like something, okay, you've got to set it up, you've got to buy it. It's additional cost instead of like saving costs. So over the long term, how do you save operators' costs? Yeah, thanks. Uh, good question and uh, good to be here. Um, yeah, if we look at the operational expenditures, right, we have high costs that come from long routes to swap batteries. So that's one, one cost element. Then we also have batteries um, that if you, you know, uh, uh, you know, they're not performing, you have defective batteries managing all of that. Um, and with Swabby, how we reduce this operational cost is we provide a network of battery swapping stations so that your warehouse space is freed up. And we also place them in strategic locations across cities so that actually the kilometers traveled to swap a battery are shorter. And then if we talk about the capex costs, right, we offer rental batteries so that you can use your funds to expand, buy more vehicles, uh, and just rely on our pool of rental batteries and the infrastructure to charge. Okay. And Acton produces, let's say, a similar product where it's not a swapping station, but it's a, it's a charging station. So the same question applies there. Like, it costs to set it up and to buy it. So in your case, what do you think, uh, what's the proposal of Acton? How do you also save then costs to the operators? Um, good question. Thanks, Marcus. It's uh, really happy to be here. Um, Station-based model is uh, all, all model in the bike sharing industry. But uh, I believe uh, in the main hub, if you have charging station, if you incentivize your customer, you can definitely reduce your OPEX because there is no, no people behind. There is no vehicle to charge it. So in the long run, you will be, in terms of OPEX, you will reduce uh, your OPEX in the long run and you will be more sustainable in terms of uh, finance. Okay. And a, a mixed model with swappable batteries. Swappable battery has, has been a game changer. In Acton, we're also providing swappable batteries. But a mixed model with a station in big hubs and a grape of geofenced area where you can have swappable, I believe is the future of the industry. And uh, that's what Acton is providing. Oh, interesting, okay. So another hardware manufacturer, Element, they were an operator before, right? So you shifted from being an operator to like starting to produce hardware. So it would be quite interesting to find out from your operator perspective, how did then that flow into the design of your vehicles? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, David. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, you know, Andrew pointed out a lot of the things, the evolution of the hardware. We've been in the business um, operating for the last 15 years before mobility was even a word and doing bike share originally on college campuses. We saw a lot of the challenges with the devices that were available then. So we moved to, instead of a sp spoke wheels, hub wheels, um, then the e-bike was evolved after that to give – 
you more range, um, mid-motor, a swappable battery in the design there. So addressing all the things we're talking about here, charging, integrating to charging stations as well. Um, but it all evolved from that experience over the last 15 years. We, um, we designed scooters as well, mopeds, the battery that fits in this bike here also fits in the scooter. It's the same swappable battery. So learning all of that from experience of being operators and understanding what operators are thinking and what they need, I think, is the key to it. So, Tom, you heard now several hardware manufacturers and, and their, let's say, their proposal, how they can save you money. So what do you think, for example, about what Swabby you act and said? Would you invest into having a docking station or battery swapping station to save costs? Yeah, it depends on the cost, I guess. Um, so we need to look at also the cost for storages to place them somewhere. So that's also a problem in many cities. So that's, uh, that, that's the next problem that needs to be solved. Okay. Uh, another thing that I think is very interesting is uh, the former duck stations, now Acton stations. You guys are integrated not only with your own bikes, but you're also integrated with vehicles from other manufacturers. So let's say I'm a new operator and I want to select all the different building stones that I want to have here. A docking station, uh, a vehicle, etc. What are the pros why it should go like four vehicles and the docking stations for the same manufacturer and not, let's say, choose your station but uh, another manufacturer for the vehicles? Yeah, there, there is two, two aspects of it. Of course, our, our station remains uh, agnostic, so you can still uh, have uh, other manufacturers into a, a universal charging station. But um, go back to your question. There's a technical aspect, because we now fully integrated Acton products to our station. It will be much more easier to integrate it. And there is also a financial aspect to it. When you, you buy the full package, the station, the e-bike, the e-scooters, of course, we'll be able to provide better discount to you. And just to back to Tom, uh, question about the, the cost. Uh, our station are uh, able to be connected to the smallest uh, grid infrastructure to uh, actually the lighting system. So by doing that, we reduce the OPEX cost a lot, can connect to any grid around. And with the rush of EV charging, we can now make build and make scale economy by creating mobility e-hubs with EV charging and micro-mobility infrastructure. I think something also which can reduce the cost. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Don't want to do anything. It's cool. All right. So really wanted to kind of uh, kind of get back on track with, with how you as an operator can really take your operation to the next level by diversifying. This entire sector is really circular. You don't just have people sharing, you don't just have uh, good sharing or delivery, you have everything. Your fleets, you might have heard this from uh, Tesla over the years, is, is they say that cars spend 95% of their time just sitting parked and not being used. It's kind of the same actually with micro mobility. Even though we have these devices uh, that are smaller and take up less space, they're not making money about 98% of the time. They're just sitting there. So how can you make the best use of your fleet? And that's where we're going to kind of uh, jumpstart with the rest of this, uh, this module. Okay. So when you're trying to, to pick out a fleet or fleets, what are the things that you look at? You look at, I want these superior hardware devices. I want an e-bike. I want a scooter. But you don't know who to go to. You've heard of Segway. You've heard of maybe Okai. Uh, maybe, as I mentioned off the top, you go to your software provider and ask for their recommendation. We say buy this, that, maybe five different options together. So you start calling around. Oh, you can't get anything because everything is being manufactured in one country on Earth, and we're having supply chain issues globally right now. So you kind of have to wait, uh, and you wait, and then you give up on this, this industry. So how do you kind of get around that? We've mentioned you can go to a company like Bullride that has fleets purchased in advance. You can come to a company like Joyride or, or other software provider that's willing ever to, uh, to buy in bulk and warehouse and keep fleets available. But it's really finding the right form factors, not just the, the right volumes. And so right now, we're still in this transitionary period where you're going to have to be patient and be very tactful in how you actually plan out your fleets. 
You have to look at how many uh, units you want to order off the top. Right now, you can get down to one scooter purchased for a, a sharing fleet. That used to not be the case. You used to have to buy 100 or 200 that would fit in a whole container. Again, if you didn't have the funds to do that, it was kind of out of your ballpark. Right now, though, it still goes back to even if you have the funds, you can't get it because the supply chain's uh, blocking you. So really, the, the, the whole thing is looking for your partners that it can actually supply the right vehicles at the right time for the right f uh, flexible funding. Okay, so one of the things that we have actually done at Joyride, just a little quick plug, we actually started reselling vehicles, and we are next week launching those vehicles on an uh, e-commerce web shop. So uh, over the next year, we're going to be onboarding a lot of our vehicle partners where you can buy whole fleets directly online or finance them or possibly lease them directly from your computer without having to call China, without having to call us directly in Toronto. You can just get on our website, buy those vehicles directly, uh, very flexible minimum order quantities, and very flexible fulfillment terms that are going to be within three weeks, depending on if you're in Europe or North America. And hopefully by next year, the globe. As I kind of keep coming back to, and you see some vehicles out here, we're still seeing these, these kind of modal improvements. Uh, we have an e-bike here from Element, very beautiful form factor, long range, swappable battery. But honestly, you're probably not going to be delivering 100 kilos worth of food uh, or packages uh, locally with that because you don't have the carrying devices built on. Whereas you have the Kigo bike over here, which we'll talk about a little bit more, that's purpose built for that specific purpose of delivering, say, food in this case. So when, when you can find a partner that can uh, group together the resources for the vehicles you need, uh, you can have access to actually get those vehicles for your purpose-built needs out in the, the sharing economy. So one more thing, again, if you haven't already, go to your Joyride Academy QR code on your little uh, placard. You can see about 14 different modules that address some form or fashion of how to acquire your fleet and the specific tools by which you can actually choose which fleet is right for you. We have a number of quizzes that can actually teach you if you need an e-bike, scooter, both, mini car if, if that's your case. So take the time now or in the future to, to check that out. Uh, and, and really, we uh, welcome you to stick around for the next section. We're going to take only a two minute break this time, and then we're going to dive into insurance. Okay? All right. Thank you.